Janie, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Let's see. Who else we got? Kimberly, thanks for coming on and, and thanks for your order for ahi flour. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about ahi flour, but I really want this more to be about the research, the omega-3 research that is, uh, has really come through and really paints a nice picture. And again, more research needs to be done. More research has to be done to really fully dive into uh, and elucidate this more properly and, and put this question, put this doubt that omega-3 nutrition can't be got through uh, plant-based uh, once and for all. But I think what we're, the, the research that we're gonna look at today paints a really, really good picture of the potential for plant-based omega-3s, especially compared to preformed omega-3s. So here's the PowerPoint. And the first one uh, we're gonna look at is, this is truly breakthrough research. Uh, there's been some other research out there that I'm gonna talk about that is that has raised a lot of questions, uh, maybe more questions than answers. Um, but once you see the final research, the latest research, it really connects the dots of these other research that have suggested things that have led the researchers to say, well, maybe this is the scenario. And this final bit of research, I think, I feel, and I'll leave that up to you to judge for yourself. Uh, the next uh, bit of research is really going to clear things. So the big question is, where does everybody get your omega-3s? And let me see if I can get the next slide up. Um, so where do you get your omega-3, EPA, and DHA? And for a lot of people, especially vegans, this has been a big concern because it was thought, oh, a lot of the research out there pointed to omega-3 needing to come from preformed EPA and DHA. And I'll, I'll really dive into what that word preformed means and why that is really important to our conversation. Preformed means it's already in its EPA state. It's already in its DHA state. It doesn't require conversion from something else. Um, so the next slide um, is fish oil. And Clearly, fish oil is not sustainable. Uh, over 50% of all the life in our oceans have already been wiped out. Uh, that's the World Wildlife Federation report saying up to 76% of freshwater fish have already been decimated, wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth. Um, and that's just in the last 40 years. That's the human impact of overfishing in the last 40 years. With the popularity of fish oil supplements, this has led to, as you can see in the next paragraph, fish oil supplement fisheries, 37.5% um, of the fisheries are accounting for 3.5 million tons of fish stocks um, destined uh, destin for fish oil supplements. And it's growing. This was several years ago, this report. Um, at this rate, they are saying we could cause the sixth great mass extinction of our oceans. That means all life in the ocean being wiped out completely. Now, we don't have to wipe it out 100% for it to be decimated or wiped out completely. All we have to do is tip the balance just enough that it can't recover. And right now we're getting really close. Some say as little as three to 10 years, we could cause the mass extinction of life in, in the oceans. That's horrific if we don't start doing something right now and we need to change our inputs of omega-3s. Um, so let's go to the next source. And why is that important? Some people say a oh, big deal, we stop eating fish. It is a really big deal because of the, uh, of the fish and the sea life collapse. What their death does is rob the oxygen out of the ocean as their bodies decay. And in that decaying process, more plants die. And in that decaying process, it causes a collapse of the plant life. Now, plant life, uh, phytoplankton, these are the microorganisms in the plant kingdom, they supply about 70% of the oxygen you and I are breathing right now. So if we wipe out the fish, we'll wipe out the phytoplankton, which then will probably decimate the, a vast majority of the population of all animals on the planet. So it's not a small deal. It's a really, really big deal. So we need to find good sources of omega-3 because omega-3 is vitally important. 
They're called essential fatty acids for a good reason. They are essential for life, meaning we have to get them from food sources. Just like essential amino acids means we have to get these from outside of our body. Our body can't produce it. Omega-3s are vitally important to joint health, to muscle health, to heart health, to brain health, to inflammation and immune uh, modulation. Important all, all the way across, even the integrity and, and uh, uh, structures of cells, uh, almost all cells uh, rely on essential fats. So vitally important for our health and we need to get consistent food sources of that. Now this study came out and really shook the world. This study, and I'll read, I'll read it verbatim so that I'm not ad-libbing, I will elaborate on it a little bit, but this one was a game changer. And this one looked at an interesting look because it included vegans and vegetarians as well as fish eaters and meat eaters. So this was an incredible one because really most of the research done on omega-3s did not include vegans, did not include vegetarians, or if they did, they didn't call them out as a subset, didn't look at them as an individual subset in the research. This one actually separated that data out. And what they found was something amazing. Now, all of the research had pointed up till now that DHA was the really big problem. E EPA, not as much a problem for the population, but DHA was the real big thing. And I think that's why a lot of vegans have been scared into thinking that they need a DHA supplement. This study rocks that idea. <laughs> So all the research had been done on animal eating populations, the standard American diet. So they're consuming preformed DHA from fish oil or from animal fats. So they were getting this preformed DHA. And what that meant was that there was plenty of DHA in their body. They were getting sufficient amounts. But they assumed because plants don't have preformed DHA, with the exception of algae, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But... Um, uh, uh, this this DHA, so they said, okay, well, let's look at it. And if we break this out, vegans should have much lower DHA because they're not getting this precious preformed DHA in their diet. So they probably have the lowest DHA of all. And they found the exact opposite. And you can look right here where it says list three, 241, 223, and 286 that 286 correlates to vegans. You read that right. The highest levels of DHA were found in vegans. Now, some people say, oh, it's probably because they were supplementing and that would still not wager everything there and probably not. But let's just look at what the researchers concluded why that variation was. Because they actually drilled down onto that because it was confounding research. Confounding research is research that gives you a uh, result that is different from a lot of the other research. Remember, all of the rest of the research, almost all of it was done on animal eating populations, people getting preformed DHA. They, when they looked at the, uh, when they included the vegans and the vegans having high DHA, how is that possible? So the very next paragraph, you see one explanation for this observation may be due to the increased conversion by those from uh, a plant-based derived ALA circulating to long chain omega-3s like DHA and EPA was significantly greater in non-fish eaters than those eating fish. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> All right, so it means that when you put a preformed source of DHA, our body may be saying, oh, great, I must have made that myself. I must have converted that myself. So I'm actually going to uh, stop. I'm gonna turn off the enzyme that converts it because I don't need any more DHA. So this is how all that research said, oh, wait a minute, we don't produce enough of the enzyme to properly convert ALA. But what happens if you take that preformed DHA away that is found in animal products or in fish oil supplements or in algae supplements? That is preformed DHA, already preformed into its DHA state. What happens? Well, then epigenetics comes in. The genes actually switch on and start producing not only 
more of that uh, enzyme, but so much more that we actually become more uh, efficient at converting to DHA than do fish eaters. Because remember, if you're taking that, that fish oil or that fish meat that you're eating and it has preformed DHA in it, the body says, I don't, that signals the body, hey, stop producing your own um, enzyme because we don't need any more DHA. But if you let the body do its own thing, it can actually optimize and it can steer and it can convert at its own needed rate. Now, this is really cool because it changes the whole conversation on thinking that we need preformed. Now, let's look at hormones. Let's look at thyroid hormone. When you include thyroid human hormone into the body in its preformed state, right? Preformed hormone, our body actually starts to shut down its own. If you go on a prescription thyroid hormone, they tell you right up front, you'll be needing to take this the rest of your life because you can shut off your own body's production. That is taking a preformed external source, putting it into the body, and the body says, well, great, I don't need to make my own anymore and shuts down. Steroids are another good example of this. So steroids are hormones, sex hormones, testosterone specifically, when you take testosterone and put it into the body, it can shut down the male's production of testosterone. Now, if you stay on testosterone a long time, you can actually permanently shut down your testosterone levels or reduce it dramatically permanently. Well, that's what may be happening inside the body too. We are taking an exogenous, an exterior source of preformed DHA, putting it in the body when it is more used to actually just saying, okay, I'm going to take ALA and convert it to whatever omega-3 I want. So let's dive into that a little bit more with the next slide. Okay, so where do you get your EPA then? Well, the study uh, did show that vegans had higher DHA levels than those consumed fish, but it showed that uh, EPA levels were slightly lower, not much, but slightly lower than in vegans. So where do vegans get their EPA? Well, flax, chia, and hemp are very popular sources of ALA, but in the bloodstream, at least, ALA does convert poorly to EPA. So next slide. So this is the conversion rate. So people, I think the vast majority of people out there, uh, forgive me, Janie and any of the, the, the science uh, folks out there who already know this stuff, but there are actually uh, six different uh, omega-3 fatty acids that are important in our conversation. And there they are on the board. And it goes from ALA, which converts to SDA, which converts to ETA, then EPA, DPA, and finally DHA. Okay, so there are actually six different forms of omega-3, not two, not the EPA and DHA that everybody is talking about. Remember, fish oil is EPA and DHA. Algae oil is, fish, is a, a EPA and DHA, and they're already preformed. So this is what's really going on in the body. The body wants these plant sources of ALA and then converts it on down the chain into what our bodies and different specific tissues need. Okay, so we find that SDA, which is the highest source of SDA on the planet in any plant that we know, is ahi flower. It's the richest source of SDA and it converts to EPA up to five times more efficiently than the ALA found in flax, chia, or hemp. Now, hemp has a little bit of uh, SDA in it, but uh, uh, ahi flower has eight times as much SDA, uh, more than any other plant that we know of right now. So SDA has its own anti-inflammatory effects, and it converts to a higher rate to ETA. Now there's a really cool study that I'm gonna talk about. So remember that SDA ETA, and we'll come back to it in a second. But next, I wanna get into the next slide, which really starts to change things. So this study, and please do me a favor, read this study. I'm gonna post all the links down below. The links are on the PowerPoint, but you can also, uh, I see we've got a dot, dot, dot link. So I'll give you the full link. Um, 
uh, in, in so that you can cut and paste if you want, or you can actually click on the link in the comments section of this post. But this study just recently came out only about a month ago. Um, it's an RCT, a, a randomized uh, control um, trial, placebo controlled contri trial, which really rocks everything. <laughs> So this one found that there is no retroconversion of DHA to EPA, but substantial conversion of EPA to DHA following supplementation. So this is the unidirectional conversion, because you can see ALA converting downstream to stereodonic acid to ETA, EPA, DPA, DHA. So it only goes one direction in the conversion rate. But the study said, wait a minute, when people supplied themselves with supplemental DHA, their EPA levels went up in the blood. That's not back converting? No. And this is really big. What happened is because that preformed DHA is in there, the body thinks it must have converted that to DHA. So it actually stops everything else from converting and EPA starts to build up. You basically clog the lines of conversion. And the body thinks, oh, I've got so much DHA. And since it's the very last rung on the ladder, it assumes it's over converting. So it stops the conversion and EPA starts to build up, starts to pile up in the bloodstream. Now, this can be a dangerous thing, but I won't talk about it because Dr. Clapper has already good at, done a good job at talking about it and why he also, Dr. Michael Clapper, uh, really uh, appreciate all that he is doing for the medical community right now. He's vegan and he is uh, suggesting that people not take preformed DHA or EPA as well for this reason. So this study really rings home why we should not be, especially as vegans, why we should consider definitely not taking preformed EPA or DHA at all and allow our body to convert what it needs for each tissue. Now, the conversion rate. Um, so um, we know that EPA can be converted to DHA. Actually, all of the omega-3s can down convert to DHA. So DHA is really not the problem. My understanding from all this study is that we may not really need to supplement with DHA at all because everything converts to it. It's the bottom of the barrel. Everything down pours to one direction. It's like pouring water down things that, that all end up accumulating down at the bottom, which is DHA. And there's a good reason for that evolutionary. DHA is important to the brain function. So of course you want that to be the bottom pool, the catch all, so that we're making sure our body can stop the conversion anywhere along the line to allow more to, uh, to convert all the way down to DHA if needed because it's very important. EPA is very important too. That's why we see higher levels of these because EPA important for heart health and muscle health. And we have a lot of muscle in our body and it's important and, and DHA important for brain health. So these are two very vital things and why there's much more of this vote uh, inside our bodies at the time. But what we're seeing is that our body can take these um, ALA or SDA the precursors can take them to the tissues really kind of, and I'm, I'm ad-libbing here a little bit. This is not true science. So forgive me for those of you in the real science field. Uh, I'm just trying to be conversational here, but basically pick up these precursors and drop them to whatever tissue they need. Dropping it to the brain tissues, okay, it's going to down convert all the way to DHA. Dropping them at the heart tissue, okay, it's going to uh, go to uh, EPA. Fluid intelligence, I'm gonna talk about that in a second because that's an amazing study. It goes to the brain and only converts down to ETA. So that's really cool. Now, remember, if you're taking EPA and DHA, see where DHA is on the ladder at the bottom and it does not retro convert. It does not convert back to any of the other five EPAs. So if you're taking DHA, your body is saying, where do I get the rest of my omega-3s? There's five other omega-3s I need for proper function, for proper health, for, for optimal health. 
you're only supplying one and it's a bottom and I can't convert it back to any of the rest of them. Why on earth would you do that? <laughs> Whereas that's why plants all start at the ALA and SDA version. That's it, because we're supposed to be eating plants. You start at the top of the ladder and let your body convert to whatever it needs when it needs it. And our body can upregulate those enzymes through epigenetics to say, okay, I'm going to convert more of that ALA to DHA or EPA or e ETA or SDA. I can convert it where our body needs it most. Let your body do its intelligent wisdom. Let it convert it. Don't tell it what it should have. We don't know what it should have. We don't know which tissue needs what. And if we're only supplying EPA and DHA, and look at where EPA is. EPA is the fourth on the ladder. If you are providing EPA, then you're not getting ETA, SDA, or ALA. All have important functions in the body. So this is really exciting because it's really confirmed. Intuitively, I said, oh my God, you know, I'm a vegan. I know this is the right. I, I, we see all these vegetarian and vegan animals out there. They're getting their omega-3 dosages. Why aren't we? Why haven't we evolved to it if we've evolved? And sure enough, the evidence shows that our biology, our conversion rates, our whole structure is set up to get ALA and SDA in their states from plants. Now, what's beautiful about eye flower, it's the highest in ALA and SDA of any plant in the world. And, and you know, when people ask me, um, a lot of people ask me, it's like, oh, how much EPA or DHA in it? And I say none. And they're like, what? Why is that an omega-3? <laughs> this is why. And it's really hard to explain this in a bullet point um, with someone. So that's why I'm doing this video to really show and help educate people on this, this whole conversion rate and why our body is set up exactly this way, our epigenetics and our gen genes to turn off and on these enzymes to produce exactly what our body needs for each specific tissue. So if your body needs ALA, it'll keep it as ALA. If it needs to convert it down to EPA, it can convert it down by just switching on those genes, producing more of the enzymes and converting it. So. But then people say, well, you know, why the conversion rate so low? So let's look at the next slide. Okay. So what about all the uh, research saying plant uh, omega-3s don't convert? Okay. So this is where we get into a definition between, and if you see it on the top there, omega-3 conversion versus omega-3 metabolism. Big difference. Okay, what they're looking at in conversion is enzymatic conversion in the bloodstream. So I'm going to read this to you and then I'll go into a little bit more explanation. So new, new research published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that when we supplement with EPA or DAP, DHA in their preformed state, like algae oil or like fish oil, um, and measure metabolic effects using car carbon isotope ratios, there is a difference between circulating EPA, DHA, and metabolized EPA, DHA coming from supplementation. So the circulating is what's just swimming around your bloodstream, what's traveling around the block, right? What's metabolized is actually inside the tissues. So that's where the magic happens. We were looking at the conversion rates and seeing, you know, not big conversion rates because the conversion isn't happening in the bloodstream. Why on earth would our body convert ALA all the way down to DHA in the bloodstream? And then the only place that can go is the brain. Well, DHA is used for other things too as well, but the majority of it going to the brain. Well, what about if there's a need for it, if it can't back convert? To, to, to EPA and it needs to go to the heart, why would you pre-convert it in the bloodstream? It makes no sense at all. We've been measuring the wrong things. Don't measure the blood, measure the tissues. When you look at the tissues, that's where the metabolization comes in. That's when all the conversion rate comes in and it goes through that step-by-step -step conversion rate so that the tissues get the exact form of omega-3 out of the six forms of omega-3 that it needs. So this is the difference between 
what your body uses in tissues like the heart or brain versus keeps circulating in the bloodstream. They found that supplemental EPA does not retroconvert back to ALA, nor does EPA, uh, DHA rather, back convert to EPA. So the researchers could not even determine if EPA converts to circulating DPA, DHA at all. That's why we saw this poor blood work samples showing, oh, only 1% of ALA converts to DHA. Well, that's in the bloodstream, of course. You don't want to retroconvert. You don't want to convert it all the way down to DHA. Then it's not useful to any for any of the other ones. What you would want to do is metabolize it when it reaches that tissues inside the tissue, and then it'll go through each one of the steps of metabolization rather than conversion. So that's why all this data out there was on animal eaters was showing um, why that because they're measuring the blood and not that. So big difference between um, circulating EPA and DHA and metabolized EPA and DHA. So on the last paragraph, it says, this confirms that focusing on EPA or DHA supplementation, while it obviously will increase your blood levels of EPA and DHA, duh, you put it in your body, it digests and goes into your bloodstream, of course it's going to be there. Um, but it does not always confer the expected benefits from naturally biosynthesized or metabolized EPA, DHA levels stemming from precursor fatty acids as which come from more complex plant-based intakes. So once again, lots of health benefits can come from the precursors. All these different uh, omega-3s are important, not just EPA and DHA. Those are two out of six. That's one third. That's like saying, okay, I'm taking the supplements for one third of my health. <laughs> Why would you do that? When you eat plants, you cover all of your omega-3 needs. That's so much better. And that's why I strongly would never choose an algae DHA because it is in preformed state, just like you would find in animals. I think so often we think that animal diets are better than plant diets when that's totally not true and the science just keeps reconfirming that it's that um, we should stop comparing ourselves to being as good as animals because plants are better than animals and this research shows it okay let's move on to the next slide and i'm going to show up some uh, corroborating evidence on this so but taking dha isn't a problem right well, I want you to think about this because this is, and I'm, I'm quoting again, these are not my words, these are quotes from the articles and studies that are out there. And I'll give you all the links. I provide the links in the study. We have provided strong evidence against previously believed concepts relating to the function of omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids biosynthesis pathway. These new findings suggest one, that there is substantial synthesis of DHA from EPA or its other precursors. Precursors mean they come before in the conversion rate and conversion flow. Uh, so there is substantial synthesis of DHA from EPA in humans. So all you really need is a good source of precursors. You don't need that DHA, maybe not at all. And look, I been vegan for 35 years. My omega-3 status is near perfect. And I have never taken an algae or a fish oil supplement ever, ever. <laughs> so, you know, where am I getting that? Well, my body is doing the work. My body is this brilliant mechanism that's already set up to take plants and convert them into exactly what I need when I need it, if I'm eating the right plants. Now, nutrition is still important. If you're testing low, please take a look at it and talk with your doctor about how you can increase that. But you can, unless you have genetic flaws or a, a real health challenge situation um, where you don't, you're not producing an enzyme as well, there may be cases where you definitely do need to do that and talk with your doctor about um, whether you are one of those that has a genetic flaw, for example, that uh, uh, doesn't allow you to produce the enzyme to convert DHA, then definitely take the DHA supplement. But 
99% of us don't have that flaw. And um, there are other times where you should talk with your uh, physician about when it's appropriate to take it. But what I'm saying is for the average healthy person, a plant-based diet is actually ideal and how our body is physiologically set up to metabolize right down the line to what we need. So the study showed focusing solely on preformed DHA and EPA will not supply the body with meaningful levels of all of the essential precursor omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids that it needs, nor in the right balance. So this is really important. And this is the researchers saying <laughs> the truth, finally. Um, and and not misinterpreting data like bloodstream data or, um, you know, taking only uh, looking at people only consuming a standard American diet or animal based diet and not including vegans in this. Now we finally have research that includes uh, vegans and we can see the difference of what's happening in our biology. When you change your diet, your biology changes, your physiology adapts and it adapts to what it optimally would like to do. If you look just by choosing one meal, a fibrous meal, you can change your microbiome by 10 to 20% or more in some uh, circumstances. And that's how magically, how amazingly adaptive our body is to adapting to what we consume. And what this research is showing is that our body is already perfectly adapted to plants and does not function as optimally when you're taking preformed sources of EPA and DHA from algae or from fish oil. So let's look at the next slide and shows what backs that up. Okay, so this is really neat. So we talked about the conversion rate only going one direction from ALA to SDA, ETA, EPA, DA, DBA, and DHA. So it only flows downhill. It does not flow up. And the only reason EPA starts to build up is because we're clogging the pop line, pipeline of conversion and fooling our body to think we're overproducing, overconverting DHA. So it starts plugging up, starts turning off those enzymes, and then all that EPA backs up. Check out Dr. Clapper's um, uh, video, recent video on why he suggests not taking preformed to find out more information stuff he can talk about, but I cannot. Um, and so when we are looking at this conversion rate, one thing that they found in this study, so uh, I'll read this study to you, determinants of fluid intelligence in healthy aging, omega-3 PUFAs um, status and uh, frontoparietal cortex structure. So this is really cool. They're looking at the brain and how omega-3s affect our brain. <clears throat> and then they're looking at which omega-3s are important for our brain. Well, we all know that DHA is important for our brain function. That's pretty been pretty well established. But the researchers actually looked at something interesting. So they found that, the authors found that circulating ALA and SDA, not EPA and DHA, predicted fluent intelligence performance and the integrity, brain integrity, brain integrity of seniors as we age. Whoa, that's right. They actually <laughs> recorded more gray matter, more actual brain matter being surviving over age, more fluid intelligence with age. Wow. And that ALA and SDA found in plants <laughs> and the highest form of ALA and SDA is in ahi flower. <laughs> so ALA and SDA, not EPA and DHA. It's interesting. They looked at people who are on a basic animal-based diet, and they found that they didn't even record any levels of ETA or SDA at all. None. <laughs> Zero. That's because if you're taking EPA and it's in its preform source, it doesn't back convert to ETA and D SDA. They are precursors. They come before it. So if you're starting out lower on the rung of the ladder, you don't get the benefits of the other ones. And what are the ones right before EPA? ETA and the SDA. And what do they do? Increase fluid intelligence and preserve our brain, actually ending up with more gray matter, more brain left over at the end of our lives. Whoa, yeah, really? 
So if you think your fo focus should be just EPA and DHA, you're missing out on ALA, SDA, and ETA, three ones that actually affect how well you think and <laughs> how well your brain processes through your entire life. I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff. This is a victory for the plant-based community, showing once and for all that this conversion really is important, that metabolism, not so much conversion, but metabolism is important, that going through all these proper steps and supplying the precursors, the top of the ladder is the most important, not the rungs down at the bottom. Everything now converts to them anyway. Why are we focused on them? Our focus should be on the precursors, ALA and SDA, and getting the best sources of those in there for optimal function. If your brain <laughs> depends on it, throughout your life, shouldn't you focus on that? <laughs> Good, then that's what your body is actually telling you. I need all six of these omega-3 fatty acids. Don't just give me two that I can't back convert to others. So uh, next slide. So what about for athletes? Obviously we're fitness nutrition and why did I, you know, why am I so much focused on omega-3s importance for heart and brain? Well, what is the heart? The heart is a muscle. It's a muscle that you use every single day in your life. As soon as you stop using it, you're not living. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty important muscle. Okay, so why is EPA important for muscle? Now, here's a really nice study that said dietary omega-3 fatty acid supplement, supplementation increases the rate of muscle protein synthesis. That's awesome. But it showed it was in older adults. So the conclusion was that omega-3 fatty acids stimulate muscle protein synthesis in older adults. And they are postulating it would be good for older adults who don't get as much exercise because it prevents the loss, um, also known as uh, sarcopenia, um, which is age-related muscle decline. Um, and muscle is really important because falls are the most uh, reason that a lot of people in nursing homes end up dying uh, from the fractures and, and uh, infections that come from it. But the reason is because they're not strong enough to support themselves and they fall, uh, they collapse. So this could help a lot of people in their elderly years. Um, but what about young people? So the next study shows that omega-3 sat saturated fatty acids, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, um, augment the muscle protein anabolic response in healthy, young and middle-aged men and women. So both genders, all ages, very important. And their uh, results were that the muscle protein concentration and the muscle size were both greater after you, you were supplementing with omega-3s. Now that's awesome because you're increasing the muscle protein concentration, which is how much protein is in the muscle or the strength of the muscle cells. And you're increasing the size of the muscle cells, which is hypertrophy. Now, if you're building a body, you want a larger size, right? If you're if you're into muscle building, if you're into competitive uh, a competitive athlete that you're focused on muscle size and or strength in powerlifting, then this actually helps with both. So let's look at uh, more research on that on the next slide. So this is the effect of EPA synthesis. So this study looked at EPA and DHA and found which was doing better in uh, human cells. Um, so EPA protein synthesis was 25% greater with those and no effect of DHA. So this is one reason why our body would not down convert all the way to DHA. Because once it's in DHA, it doesn't go anywhere else. You can't convert it again. It's, it's the end of the line. So why would our body convert EPA to DHA in the bloodstream when our muscle cells really require EPA to um, do proper protein synthesis? That's why you're not seeing that conversion. Let the body convert what it needs where it needs it. So EPA protein synthesis, 25% greater with no effect of DHA. Imagine if you just put in a DHA, then you're not getting sufficient amounts of EPA. Now the body will try to overcompensate that by shutting off the enzyme and trying to back up EPA so that more uh, the conversion rate stops at EPA and lets it pile up there. The body will try to adapt to that situation. But 
ideally, let your body do its thing. Let it do what its wisdom is cut out to. Let it convert what it needs. Don't junk up the, the whole process. Um, so not only did it help increase protein synthesis, but it decreased protein breakdown. So the catabolization of muscle proteins, which is seen in sarcopenia, um, which is the muscle breakdown. When we're under stress, cortisol can break down that protein. So this actually helps the integrity of the cells, helps maintain that muscle, and can give you a longer uh, effects of it. That's how I can maintain muscle a lot stronger, even though I'm 57 years of age, and I'm still in the best shape of my life. So the next uh, slide, we'll take a look at what is ALA and SDA as the primary precursors to all of the rest of the omega-3s. So that's more what we should be focusing on the top of the ladder so that we can get all of the rest based on what our body needs and let the body make the decision of what it needs, when it needs it, where it needs it. So the next slide is a interesting study that went head to head, ahi flour going head to head with fish oil for both two factors, inflammation and immune health. Now this one's really important and I will jump down to the conclusion. This is the first report of the positive effect of consuming SDA rich dietary oil on interleukin 10. There are a bunch of different interleukins. They are cytokines. Um, certain uh, of these cytokines are pro-inflammatory, certain of them are anti-inflammatory. Uh, IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and SDA helps upregulate an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Now, this is really important right now with all that's going on, because over uh, production of our body to fight a uh, attacking lung, <laughs> Um, I'll just leave it at that and leave those words out of it. But when we overproduce the cytokines that cause so much inflammation, the inflammation draws in fluids and that fluid can fill our lungs and basically cause us to drown to death. That's a horrible way to go. But what we need is a balance of those pro-inflammatory to, to, to combat the situation, yet the anti-inflammatory to bring that inflammation down so it, we actually don't end up uh, being injured or dying from the inflammatory state. So some inflammation is necessary. Look, when you work out, you want some inflammation. Now, uh, like when you work out, you stress the muscle, you release uh, arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is made by omega-6 fatty acids. <laughs> so it's converted into arachidonic acid. But arachidonic acid acts as a pro-inflammatory to create some inflammation around the muscle. Uh, to send cell signaling. So that pro-inflammation sends cells, hey, come over, let's let's repair the cell, let's grow this cell, let's let's reinforce this cell, let's multiply the cell in case of hyperplasia, where you're adding actual more cells so that you can handle the stress. So the next time your body is better prepared, better adapted to handle that stress. And that's muscle growth in a nutshell. <laughs> so you want a balance of those pro-inflammatory cytokines and the anti-inflammatory cytokines. You want to bring down that inflammation afterwards so that it actually doesn't cause damaging effects. Now, what's also unique about this study is this is the first in investigation of an immune response following the con consumption of SDA found in plants like ahi flower, the highest in SDA of all plants, um, and indicates dietary oils such as ahi flower may share immune modulating properties that are typically associated with the consumption of marine oils, fish oils, krill, this sort of thing. So this is amazing, showing once again, plants are as good and effective for immune health, for inflammation health, for um, for all of the things. Plus, plants offer those precursors that really aren't available when you're getting preformed EPA from and DHA from animals like fish or from algae oil, which is also a preformed source. So you're just not getting those precursors that are doing all these amazing benefits, increasing fluid intelligence, preserving our brain throughout our lives, reducing inflammation and inflammatory uh, cytokines anti-inflammatory cytokines. I mean, this is amazing. So, um, gosh, uh, let's move on to the next slide. 
So to wrap this up, yes, I, we do sell ahi flour. I was the first person in the world to bring ahi flour to market in a product. Very proud of that. And it won the next E. The next E is the top supplement award in the United States. It's given out at the largest natural product show, uh, Natural Products Expo West in Los Angeles with over 90,000 uh, attendees, over 3,000 uh, different uh, brands with literally probably over 100,000 different products or more um, uh, at the show. And out of all of those, Ahi Flower was chosen as the top supplement of the year award. So best new ingredient. And I'm really proud. I've been working with the folks uh, that produced Ahi Flower and uh, really looking for a breakthrough, best in class, omega-3, so that you guys can get the best results in your health, but also, as you've seen, the best results in your fitness nutrition. Everything I do, I try to focus on what is the best thing nature has to offer for this? And why is it not out in the market? Is there research to back it up? Does it promote health as well as fitness goals? And is it the best that nature has to offer? That's what I focus on with every single one of the products that I try to bring out. And that's why we've won the next year award, not once, but twice, was also clean green protein with lentine. No preformed DHA or EPA in this at all. So again, when you look at the label and you go, how much EPA or DHA in, is in it? Please let somebody know when you <laughs> when they do this. Now that you have the education, please spread this around because we need a whole new re-education on uh, what we thought we knew about omega-3s. The EPA and DHA are actually maybe not the best thing for our body. They could actually cause the body to, to, to bottle up, to not function proportionally, and to not get the other precursor EPA, uh, uh, above EPA, which is SDA, ETA, and ALA, which all have anti-inflammatory functions and other health benefits, including brain health and immune modulation. All of these benefits you're not getting if you're getting preformed EPA and DHA and relying on that is your only source of omega-3. Now, I know a lot of people are eating good fruits and vegetables and things like that, but I always like to look for what the, what nature has in best to make sure we're at optimal levels. You can be healthy and that's good, that's fine. You can be getting good results in the gym, but for those of you who want to really get the most out of life, I want to provide products that will give you optimal benefits, optimal states, of omega-3, optimal states of nutrition, like in uh, clean green protein. The highest in nutrition of any plant in the plant kingdom is that. The highest in protein of any plant, which, which is in lentine, which is in clean green protein. And the highest, of course, in omega-3. The highest known source of ALA, SDA. And it also contains GLA. It's actually the highest in SDA and GLA. And GLA has its own host of benefits, especially for females. Uh, and in, in hormone modulation. And uh, so lots of health benefits from this. Please let's change the conversation away from preformed EPA and DHA and on to getting those precursors that give you all six of your omega-3s that our body needs to be in its optimal, functional, healthy state. So I hope you get a lot out of this uh, presentation. Uh, I put a lot of research, a lot of work into this. This is several years in the making. But this latest research that came out showing the absolute unidirectional change has been great. Please let me know your questions. If you're a healthcare professional, if you're a scientist in this field, I'd love your feedback on it. I don't mind being wrong. I really don't. Because you correcting me will just give me new, better information for uh, to give people out there. And I want to get, I sincerely want to give the best information. So. Now, don't don't come on there and just spam and, and hate. I'll just delete you, so don't waste your time. <laughs> but if you have real good information, if you've got good studies, and again, I know there's a whole lot of studies out there that show you know, the EPA, but that was done on animal eating people. <laughs> show me a study that includes vegans like these research studies do. Show me ones that include taking consuming precursors like SDA and ALA. 
show me research with that is not, and I will change my story. But until then, this research is really painting a very clear picture that vegans were right all along. Yes, we, our body is genetically predisposed to go through that proper chain of conversion. Let our body do its wise thing. Let our body do what it's supposed to do. Just give it the ammo, the nutrition that it needs to actually convert to whatever it needs, when it needs it, for the tissues it needs it for. Listen to the wisdom of the cells. And to quote um, one of my big favorites, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, when you see the wisdom of the cells, you can see the magic that happens. And to think we as human beings are, are not learning from the wisdom of the cells or even thinking we know better is just silly. Um, so I will continue to do my part to learn from nature uh, and learn from the wisdom of our cells and try to keep conveying that information as it turns. Remember, Science is an ever-changing field. As long as we keep getting new research, it'll keep changing the, the, the conversation. So this is not a end point. This is where we're at now. And with the knowledge that we have, let's move forward and continue to find further research that confirms that a compassionate diet is a diet that is both compassionate to animals, compassionate to our environment, and compassionate to our bodies. It's doing the right thing all the way across the board. And I'm glad to find more and more research that is confirming what my heart already knows. It's the right thing to just eat plants and not and leave the poor animals alone. So I hope you enjoyed this. Keep working out if you can, when you can, and make sure you're getting the proper nutrition. Feed your body. It's your best friend. Treat it like that, We're giving it what it needs and get out of the way. Let it do its thing. It knows best what it needs to do. All it is asking for is the proper nutrition. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do like it, please share. Please talk about it with people. And please challenge anything. Read the studies. Ask the questions. This is what it's all about. It's a conversation. I don't want to be right. I just want the right thing. And so it's not about me. It's not about ego. It's about what is the best information out there and what is it telling about how we can possibly live our healthiest, happiest, most enjoyable life? That's what I want for you. And I will always want for that for you. And I will keep changing and keep looking and keep digging up research to share with you as long as we go. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, please share and uh, hope you have a great, healthy, happy day. <laughs>